Okay. I, th I think that worked. Good to see you. Hello. Good evening. And uh, if you're in other parts of the world, good whatever time it is, because time is a bitch, but the fact that it still exists is good and moving forward and et cetera, et cetera. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm being cranky about life and mortality um, at the moment. Not for any specific reason, I hasten to say. I mean, nothing that happened in the last 24 hours or anything like that. Uh, just been reflecting on things today. Um, so anyway, uh, let me see. Where are we? Okay. So it is uh, just about a minute after 7 o'clock in California, which is where I and some of the people listening here are. And wherever it is, or whatever it is, where you are, I hope it's been good for you so far. Um, what is what is it that I have to tell? Not a whole lot. Um, I've been uh, just doing the stuff. As I mentioned, we've got a lot going on domestically at the moment, and so I've been working on that. The book, um, I'm just about starting the, the revisions, the, the final draft of Navigator's Children because I've gotten almost all my feedback back on it, um, at least enough to get uh, su substantially started. And that's what I'm working on. And then I'm thinking about how I'm going to work on uh, the, the rewrite of the third Ordinary Farm book, which is what we're reading, is the second Ordinary Farm book at the moment, which, as I mentioned to you, is because I'm putting y'all to work um, doing a, uh, a form of homework for me or doing homework with me because I had to reread it anyway um, because I think it was written in like 2011 or something like that. So as, as is often the case when you get to this point in a career, it's a while uh, since you last dabbled in a particular world. Um, I've just been going through that at great length, of course, since about 2014, 2015, with the Ostinard books that I'm finishing, of which The Navigator's Children is the final one. Uh, and that goes back even further, because the last time I was really working on those books was back in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. So I'm spending a lot of time in my own past, which is one of the many reasons I'm having dark negative thoughts about mortality, because, you know, so many things have changed since then. And so many people that uh, I cared about and care about still are no longer with us. Anyway, not to bring y'all down, because that is not my intention, and that is not my overall mood. That just happened to be something that hit me just a little while ago today as I was looking at some pictures of some dear friends. So, what else is going on? Not really much. We've had a, a respite from bad weather, um, which is nice, because we had a whole lot of bad weather, including sleet, which, you know, the, the chances of getting sleet in my part of Northern California is usually zero or even a negative number. It's, it's, you know, it's really not something I remember ever happening because I'm not talking about hail. We have occasionally get like once a winter, maybe we get hail, um, you know, little round hailstones. This was absolute sleet. Uh, when I got up in the morning, a few days back in the midst of the storm season, um, we actually had little sharp, shards, I guess is the best possible word, little sharp bits of ice all over the surfaces of the yard and the deck of the house and presumably up on the roof, although I didn't bother to go look at those before they melted away. Um, it was very strange. And we heard it during the night. We heard the, the, the hail storm or the sleet storm or whatever it was. And of course, large dog Johnny totally lost his stuff. I mean, he just completely freaked out. He was walking back, literally walking back and forth on top of me on the bed, um, trying to let me know that something terrible, world-shattering, apocalyptic was happening. Um, it was just slightly louder than the rain, but since Johnny already thinks every time it rains that it's a, a, a world-shattering event, um, this really pushed him around the twist. By the way, which reminds me, just because I had mentioned when I was on the air last night about Johnny um, when he was a young pup and how our daughter used to call him cow nose. I don't remember how that came up, and I don't remember any significance to it whatsoever, but I, I put up a picture of young, young Johnny when we first got him back in 2012 or so, 
um, with his his blotchy nose. So anybody who's interested in that, it's right here on my Facebook page. Oh, let me think. What else? Do I have anything else useful to say? Not tremendously. Um, this has been one of those weeks where it's just been about various kinds of work and, and uh, responsibilities. I hate responsibility. I just hate it. Um, but, you know, once you become a parent of humans and animals, um, you are either in for permanent responsibility or you are irresponsible. And I have always prided myself on not being tremendously irresponsible, at least, not taking any pleasure in my occasional veer into irresponsibility. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it's just in the course of a normal, normal week, there's a thousand things to do. And then we're also going through a lot of other craziness right now that I won't bore anybody with. So, <coughs> excuse me. So that's basically what's going on. Other than that, we're all okay. Here, I hope the same is true for you. Um, one of our uh, family members, our, our dear sister-in-law, is down with COVID at the moment, but fortunately, from what I've heard, it's a pretty mild case. Um, everybody here in our household, which currently consists of four humans and, God, we're down to three animals? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, four humans and three non-human animals. Um, we're all pretty well. And we are enjoying the heck out of the, the suspension of storm. Um, there's supposed to be a couple days of rain next week. Um, I know this sounds like I'm talking about this stuff a lot. But if you lived with John and Walter, our two dogs, you would understand why it's a bit of an obsession with me. Because it really is what I do all day in bad weather is, is shuttle the dogs in and out, comfort the big dog, deal with the small dog who has a, a bladder the size of the head of a pin and is needing to go out every few seconds or else he just lets fly wherever he is. Um, so that's, 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 that's just the mildest, tiniest little bit of what goes on during the glamorous life of a, a working writer um, every day. But, you know, I don't think you guys could stand too many stories of my fabulous lifestyle all at the same time. Um, I think you can see my fabulous lifestyle behind me. Um, even more than usual, people are storing stuff in my office, so there's just things everywhere, um, which is all fine, unless I'm trying to find something, in which case it's ever so slightly annoying. Um, but, you know, there are people out there who have much larger things to complain about, and by and large, we're well, we're happy, sort of. <laughs> we're healthy, more or less. Um, so, that's that. Let me think. Is there anything else I wanted to talk about? Not particularly. Um, let me go see if I've got folks here um, that need me to say hello to them. And I will say hello to the folks who have commented so far because at the moment that's the only way I can tell who is online with me. Um, and so I've got uh, Melissa. Hello, Melissa. Good to see you. Jack is here again. Hello, Jack. Welcome back. Greg, hello Greg, and Claudia, a pleasure as always. Ray, good to see you. Pierre, Pierre is here, um, and Isaac is here. Hello Isaac, and Barban, a pleasure. And Jared, good to see you Jared. Kristen, I'm always glad to see you Kristen. And Medardo, my good friend. Um, Christy, hello Christy, this is Christy Sanders. We have a couple of different Christies that I think that show up at different times, but Christy is one of the regulars. Barbara, hello Barbara, and Susan, this is Susan Shamblin. We have Susans and Suzannes both. Tiffany, hello, Penny, hello, and Carl, good to see you too. So, um, anyway, let me see if there's anything else that was on my poor, poor fragmented brain. I don't think so. Um, and we lost this entirely, so I have no idea what's going on here. Um, all right, okay, there we go. That came, did that come back? Yes, it came back, super. Okay, so um, unless I can think of something else that I desperately need to do or that I desperately wanted to talk about. Um, no, I can't really, I can't really. I'm trying to think about any, Tales or stories? No, because we're just doing the... I, I, I spent a good part of the day yesterday replacing Johnny's bell. And I think I told everybody about that last night. So that, that's, uh, 
long and short of it is is that um, our large dog Johnny is very sweet with people and mostly with uh, certainly with with Walter the tiny dog Walter actually bullies Johnny um, even though he Johnny outweighs him by like 20 to 1 or something but um, you know Walter used to actually jump up when Johnny was because Walter is the older dog so he's higher up the the uh, the hierarchy and uh, when we first got Johnny and Johnny was the youngest of three um, Walter for the first time had a dog who was his junior and for a dog who weighs about four and a half pounds this was a big deal to have a 70 80 pound dog um, who was suddenly in you know bottom of the totem pole with Walter above him and so Walter would discipline Johnny when Johnny got out of hand Walter would literally leap up and latch on to Johnny's jowl and hang on it to let Johnny know when Walter thought he was out of line which was not usually anything Johnny had really really done it was just Walter being a little Napoleon um, so I don't know how I get started on this but but basically just that uh, oh that I remember now so that's about the only animal that Johnny really respects so we've had to keep that's one of the reasons why Lily the cat the one behind me over there on my my right over my right shoulder um, why Lily the cat is uh, living downstairs because Johnny never understood cats and the first time I tried to introduce him to one of our cats um, many years ago when we first had him the first thing he did as I was holding the cat out and petting Johnny's head is Johnny went oh I'm being offered a meal and immediately not angrily not to inflict pain but just like oh thank you I was hungry just reached out and engulfed the lower half of the cat this was our cat Jupiter um, in his mouth and had like Jupiter's entire leg down his throat I don't know how he managed that and um, the kids had come in um, uh, the the only two kids we had at that time and and Deborah and they were all standing around when this happened and everybody just completely freaked out and they're all screaming and yelling and all this and me meanwhile I'm holding this cat who's halfway down a dog a large dumb dog's throat and I didn't know if I, the cat wasn't struggling particularly but I didn't know and then maybe he's just panicked right maybe he's just kind of blank black blacked out because of having a, a huge crocodile like dog swallow part of him so I stuck my arm into Johnny's mouth so he couldn't close it all the way um, and I guess this encouraged him to to squeeze down a little tighter so I was sitting there with Johnny literally trying to bite through my arm not aggressively but just like oh okay I have to bite harder because now there's more in my mouth and um, everybody was screaming and yelling and I'm going uh, guys I'm in horrible pain here if somebody could help and not just scream uh, <laughs> it, it was quite a to do but anyway so this all by way of telling you that Johnny the dog is not necessarily to be trusted with small animals he's he's a dog of he's got a couple of different kinds of hunting dog in him and it became very clear early on that that you know we live in the middle of a sort of oasis of, of trees and hill hillside and um, vegetation and most of our property is wild and so we have lots of animals and birds and that's what Deborah and I have always really liked about it um, unfortunately that also meant that there are lots of uh, even though we've got some fences around the inner part of the property we they, you know they're meant they're just tons of animals on the property all the time around our house and so I decided early on that if I didn't want to be constantly either picking up late <laughs> late lamented animals of one kind or another um, and uh, burying them that I would have to make sure that Johnny could not just easily hunt whatever was around because he is a hunting dog as I mentioned and uh, so from that point on I started belling him because I figured that was the best compromise so I'm not being mean to him for following his natural instincts but I'm not trying to shove away all the animals that this is where they live and this is where they you know pursue their lives so I just hung a big old bell around Johnny and every now and then it disappears or it gets ripped off or broken or whatever and I have to replace it but then this last couple times I kept going to pet stores to get like a little parakeet bell and the only ones I could find were attached to like huge parakeet toys that are meant to hang in the cage and they're like you know I can't even show you on camera but you know like 
a foot long and all different pieces, moving pieces. I have one little bell on the bottom and they all cost like 18 or 19 bucks. And I just was like, I'm not going to spend $19 on a, a five cent copper bell. I'm just not going to. So I finally found some new bells and Johnny sounds most musical. Um, he sounds like he should be uh, a watchdog in Lothlorien or something every time he moves now because the bell, the new bell hangs right on top of his dog tags and other things. And so he makes this shimmery ringing sound now. It's uh, quite charming, although I think Johnny's still a little taken aback by being so noisy, especially after going a day without, two days without bells. So that's my news, really, honestly, that's like, that was the highlight of excitement of my week, was finding a new bell at the art supply store for Johnny. Um, and working, of course, working on various things. Anyway, so before I start reading, were there anybody else that had showed up that I haven't said hello to? Um, let me see, what have we got here? Comments, hello, hello, everybody. No, they're going to put that somewhere where I can't read it, of course. I hate this setup. Um, let me see. So who else? Tiffany, Penny, Carl. No, I said hello to all those folks. Uh, Calvin, I'm pretty sure I said hello to, but if I didn't, hello, Calvin. Okay. So that at least gives me an idea that folks are here and I will go ahead and start. So I think if I remember correctly, we were starting a new chapter. Yes, we were. And that chapter is chapter nine, Kingery. And what happened in the last chapter that was of significance is basically that, okay, Tyler and Lucinda are at Ordinary Farm for the summer. This is their second summer. Um, they're already a little freaked out about the way things have changed and the new security procedures after last summer, which include uh, bunyips in the creek um, and manticores stalking around the property at night, held only in by like cyclone fences. Um, and at the same time, Tyler is, Tyler is very upset because Colin has free run of the, the library where Tyler last time found what he, uh, the, the washstand mirror that appears to lead into kind of like an alternate version of Ordinary Farm and uh, where he found the necklace belonging to Gideon, his great uncle Gideon's missing wife, Grace, who's been missing for years and years and years, um, and is the great tragedy of Gideon's life. And we will learn more about that in this book. But um, since then, Gideon has sent Colin, the witch, patient, patient needle son, into the library to spend time there doing something, and Tyler is very upset. But when he finally goes into the library to keep an eye on Colin, he realizes that the washstand mirror has been taken away by Mrs. Needle and that this very dangerous, crazy, magical object is currently being held by the witch who they, they know has already tried to kill Tyler once and um, hates them because of the threat that they represent to her and to Colin, her son. Anyway, so that's kind of what was going on up to this point. Now we are starting with chapter nine, Kingery. Lucinda was beginning to appreciate traveling by horse cart, the only wheeled vehicle Mr. Walkwell would ever use. Rattling along through the open air made her feel so vital, so connected, as if nature itself was flowing through her. Mr. Walkwell, horns and goat legs hidden for the trip into town, held the reins loose but taut, almost talking to the horse Culpepper through the leather straps. When he saw her watching, the old man gifted her with a quick, careful smile, something she hadn't seen much. The sunlight was golden, the day not too hot, and the air filled with the smells of eucalyptus and warm yellow dust. Things even seemed to be going well at the farm this year, why wasn't Mr. Walkwell happier? Is everything all right, Lucinda? asked Colin Needle. You seem very quiet. That sounded like sincere interest, which surprised her a little. I'm fine, just enjoying the ride. Do you think it's going to rain? Colin looked up at the bruised gray sky. Maybe. Gideon says there hasn't been weather like this since 1983. They had floods then. 
but it won't rain anywhere near that hard this summer, I don't think. 1983 was well before Lucinda had been born. She was impressed. Have there really been a lot of storms here this year? Colin smiled. Oh, yes, thunder, lightning. The week before you came, it was almost like being in a war. Boom, crack, boom. Sarah said the world might be ending. He laughed, and Lucinda found herself laughing with him. They both fell silent again, but this time it was a comfortable silence. When they reached downtown Standard Valley, such as it was, Mr. Walkwell tied Culpepper in the cart to a hitching post outside the store. Colin stood up. I have to go over to Rosie's for something. Shall I meet you somewhere? The old man looked up, squinted, and said, You can do what you wish, Master Needle. Just be back here in an hour. Where are you going? Lucinda asked, then immediately regretted it. Surely secretive Colin Needle wouldn't take kindly to being quizzed about his plans. But, to her surprise, Colin only grinned. I'm going to Rosie's to use their wireless connection. Lucinda couldn't help laughing at the idea of the ancient diner with its glowering owner as a fancy internet cafe. Wi-Fi? You're kidding, right? No. Rosie lets me use it when I'm in town, and I help him with his accounting software. Now Colin laughed, too. It sounded quite ordinary and pleasant. Yes, even Standard Valley is finally stumbling into the 21st century. He climbed down, threw Lucinda a little goodbye salute, then walked off toward Rosie's, cradling his laptop as carefully as a bundle of dreams. Lucinda picked up a large bag of carrots at the grocery store, then decided it wasn't big enough. They were for a dragon, after all, and dug down to find a larger one. When she had paid for it, she headed back to the feed store, where Mr. Walkwell was talking sourly to the clerk about the horrors of machinery. Bored, Lucinda stared out of the window at the main street and wondered when they were going to see the Carrillos again, the kids from the farm next door. She and Tyler had first met them here in Standard Valley last year on another of Mr. Walkwell's shopping trips, and they had all become friends. She thought it was a little strange they'd been back on the farm so long and still hadn't heard anything from Carmen and the rest. She and Tyler would have to find a way to contact them. Mr. Walkwell was still denouncing the dangers of steam power to the confused counter clerk when Lucinda finally gave up and wandered outside into the hot gray afternoon. The air smelled like rain, but none was falling yet. She briefly considered going over to join Colin at the diner, but felt reluctant to do that. What if he thought she had a crush on him? Which, though he occasionally acted almost human, she most definitely did not. She wandered away from the center of town instead. It didn't make for a very long walk past the few stores and the train station until the only buildings around her were board houses with small fenced front yards. As Lucinda turned at the furthest houses and started back, someone stepped out of the shadows at the front of the train station, a tall man who angled toward her with long strides. By the time she had reached the center of the block, the stranger was walking beside her. You, child, he said, stop and talk to me for a moment. Every instinct told Lucinda to run. Only the fact that they were standing in the middle of the town's main street in the middle of the afternoon, with people watching them from outside the diner, gave her courage to stand her ground. The towering stranger had to be nearly six and a half feet tall, she thought, with the easy physical grace of a young man, but his face was tanned and hard as old leather. His hair was black, as were most of his clothes and his wide-brimmed hat. He looked more like a gunslinger out of a western movie than a farmer, a man out of time. A sudden understanding felt like icy fingers on her neck. This man did look like someone from another time, like someone who had stepped out of the fault line. Suddenly she was terrified. I saw you and Simos Walkwell roll into town, the stranger said in a slow, confident drawl. Are you staying out at the Tinker Farm? 
Gideon Goldring's an old friend of mine. Lucinda just stood, mouth working helplessly. You don't have to be afraid of me, child. He showed her a flash of teeth. I'm not your enemy. It was hard to swallow down the lump in her throat enough to make words. Something about this man made him seem as though the day itself had created him out of dust and summer heat. I'm sorry, but I'm not supposed to talk to people I don't know. Of course you're not, he said. Smart girl. But I'm no stranger. Just ask Gideon and the rest. Tell him you saw Jackson Kingery. Tell him I said I'll be coming by real soon to catch up on old times. Can you remember that? Lucinda nodded. The tall man bent over. Lucinda could smell liquor on his breath. His smile seemed like a trick he'd learned without understanding it. A dog taught to shake hands. I'm glad to hear it, child. We'll talk again one day, you and I. That's a promise. He straightened and walked past her, his coat brushing her hand as softly as a bird's feathered wing. His boots clicked on the sidewalk as he walked around the corner of the train station and disappeared. A drift of raindrops, light as flower petals, sprinkled her face and hands and made dark spots on the street. Lucinda let out the breath she had been holding so long she had become dizzy, and then she ran. Never go near that man, never! Mr. Walkwell was so upset he nearly knocked over his cup of coffee. Inside Rosie's, heads turned at every table. He came up to me in the street. Next time you see him, do not talk. Run away. He is evil. The old man shook his head and growled a startlingly inhuman sound. For just the briefest moment, Lucinda remembered Mr. Walkwell dancing on his naked hooves along a hillside beneath the night sky, a wild creature come from elder days. We're surrounded by... Legends and fairy tales, she marveled yet again. And monsters, too. But who is he, she asked, this kingery? He came out of the fault line, of course, said Colin Needle quietly, eyes still on his laptop screen, like we all did, in one way or another. What? Lucinda was distracted by this. But you, you said you were born here, Colin. I was. My mother was pregnant when Gideon brought her here. Lucinda wondered, not for the first time, who Colin's father had been. Neither of the Needles ever talked about it. But if that man came out of the... Colin looked up at her sharply, so Lucinda mouthed the words, Fault line, too. Why doesn't he live at the farm? He did, for a while, said Colin. But he didn't like the rules. Mr. Walkwell looked around to make sure no one in Rosie's was listening to their quiet conversation. No more talk about him until I have spoken to Gideon. Kingery came with old Caesar, Colin whispered to Lucinda as they followed Mr. Walkwell out of the diner. That's all I know. With Caesar? She couldn't put ancient sweet-tempered Caesar together with Kingery. With that face full of sharp edges and violence... As they approached the wagon, she looked nervously up and down the street, seeing Kingery's menacing form in every shadow. As a result, she stared right at Steve Carrillo, standing in front of the general store with his popsicle, for several seconds before she recognized the husky boy. Steve! she shouted. Oh, wow, Steve, it's me, Lucinda. We're back. He waved and then called to someone inside the store. A moment later, Carmen Carrillo, his older sister, came hurrying out onto the sidewalk. She saw Lucinda and ran toward her, Steve following, and they met in the center of the street to exchange hugs and excited greetings. Colin watched them embrace for a moment, then walked on toward the wagon without saying anything. Carmen was taller and had lost weight. She looked quite glamorous, Lucinda thought, but Steve seemed like he might have put on a few pounds. I missed you guys so much, Lucinda said. I was wondering when we'd get to see you. Tyler's back at the farm. He'll wish he came along now. 
Yeah, Alma's back at our place, Steve said of the third and youngest Carrillo child. She's sewing stuff this year, and she hardly ever comes out of her room. She gave up wood carving, Lucinda asked. That's too bad, Steve laughed. Nah, she still carves, too, and does clay sculptures. Her room is more cluttered up than mine. Not possible, said Carmen. Wow, great to see you, Luce. I shared your emails with Steve and Alma. She smiled. Well, not everything. Thank you. How are you guys? An odd look crossed Carmen's face, sliding like a shadow. Okay, I guess. Kind of. We're having a lot of weird trouble with that guy from last year. She looked around, but the small street was all but empty. The one who landed on your farm? In his helicopter? Edward Stillman? Lucinda suddenly felt a chill. This new guy, Kingery, the crazy rich guy, what did the universe have against Ordinary Farm? What kind of trouble? He keeps offering our folks money, said Steve. He's buying up land all around your property, Carmen explained. So, of course, he wants our farm because we're right next door. He's offering tons of money, too, Steve said. We heard our mom and dad talking about it. They don't want to sell, but it's a lot of money. My dad keeps trying to talk to your Uncle Gideon about it, but your uncle won't ever call him back or, or anything. Dad even went over to see him, but Gideon wouldn't even come out, so that, that come out of that big old crazy gate he built. Have you seen that? Oh, oh right, you must have. Lucinda smiled, but her joy at seeing two of her friends had soured. Stillman back, and now this kingery hanging around. What next? Hello, you bad children, Mr. Walkwell greeted the Carrillos, but without his usual sly good cheer. Lucinda, we must go back. We have things to discuss with Gideon. Tell him my father really needs to talk to him, Mr. Walkwell, Carmen said. Please, it's important. The wiry old man looked overwhelmed in a way Lucinda had never seen before. I will tell him, of course, but Gideon Goldring does what he wants, always. Come, Lucinda. Bye, guys, she shouted when she'd climbed aboard the wagon next to silent Colin. See you soon, I hope. Come for the fourth again, yelled Carmen. That was totally fun last year. To Lucinda's surprise, Ragnar was waiting for them out by the new gate. The big Norseman did not smile as they came in, only held the gate open and waved the cart through, then closed it by hand afterward and secured it with a bolt. "'What's wrong with the gate?' Colin asked. "'It should open and close by itself.' "'The invisible lightning is gone,' Ragnar said. "'Your mother turned it away or off.' whatever you say, until we know what is happening. He was clearly agitated. Did Gideon go with you? Did he stay in town? Mr. Walkwell seemed as surprised by this as Lucinda. No, Gideon was here when we left. He did not go with us. Lucinda was beginning to feel really frightened. She looked at Colin, but he seemed as confused as she was. What's going on? We cannot find him, Ragnar said. We have been looking everywhere since just after you left this morning. Everyone on the farm has been searching, and we have looked in every place we can think, all through the house, the barn, the hills, the pens. He shook his head. But Gideon has disappeared. He is gone. Chapter 10 leaving the garden. And he was so scary, Tyler, Lucinda whispered, like, like the devil or something. His sister couldn't stop talking about Kingery, the mysterious fault line escapee, but although Tyler was impressed and even worried by her experience, it seemed like the least of their problems just now. The farm folk were assembled in what Tyler and Lucinda called the snake parlor. 
the big front room, with the stained glass window of Adam and Eve being tricked in the Garden of Eden, the serpent running all around the picture as if to draw a noose around them with its body. Tyler couldn't help wondering whether gathering beneath a glowing picture of Satan was really the best choice at such a time. The rain that had pattered on his window and the roof a short time ago was gone, and already the day was growing unbearably hot again. Everyone was talking at once, and everyone sounded frightened. And no surprise, Gideon was not just their protector, but the only thing that connected most of these people to the present century. Tyler couldn't even imagine what Sarah and the Mongolian amigos and all the others must be feeling. Mrs. Needle stood in the middle of the room, frowning, her face hard as carved ivory. "'You must all be quiet and listen now,' she announced. "'Do you hear me? Silence!' "'Why, you are not Gideon,' cried Hoka, one of the amigos. "'You are not the master of the house.' His two silent companions looked impressed that he would talk back to Mrs. Needle, but they also looked as if they wished he hadn't done it. Colin Needle had a strange look on his face, too, Tyler thought. A bit green around the gills, as Tyler and Lucinda's mom liked to say. Guilty conscience about something, Tyler wondered. Hush, all of you. Mrs. Needle's voice was sharper this time. Don't be foolish. Nobody is claiming to be the master here but someone must take charge. Then it should be Simos, said Ragnar loudly from the doorway. Walkwell has been here longer than any of us. He has always been Gideon's right hand. Mrs. Needle rolled her eyes in disgust. This is not about who is in charge. It is about finding Gideon. Have you searched the whole house? Tyler demanded. It's miles long. Why are we wasting time blabbing? Gideon could have, could have fallen down somewhere where we can't hear him calling. A lot of the others murmured in agreement, but Mrs. Needle was not having it. Of course we have searched the house, Master Jenkins, and since it is large and full of unused rooms, we will continue to do so. Leave that chore to those who know the place, myself, sir, and her kitchen help, and Caesar, one of the kitchen help suddenly rose from her seat. It was the tall African girl, Azinza, swaying like a tree in the wind. I saw Gideon in a dream, she cried. Oh, for goodness sake, hissed Patience Needle. This is quite out of order. Sit down now, you foolish girl. She turned away, leaving Azinza open-mouthed. Nobody has seen Gideon since supper yesterday. Caesar says his bed was not slept in. We will organize into groups. The women will search all through the house, while the men... But I tell you, I saw him, cried Azinza. I saw what happened to Mr. Gideon. Mrs. Needle turned on her with cold fury. Enough of this foolishness. You have no right to stop her speaking, said Ragnar, moving up beside Azinza. For a moment he and Mrs. Needle stared at each other, and the hatred between them made the hairs stir and lift on Tyler's neck. At last, Mrs. Needle waved her hand in disgust and turned away. Go on, the big man told Azinza. Tell what you saw, girl. This is not foolishness, she said, but she could not quite look Patience Needle in the eye. My... People used to come to me for my dreams. They called me goddess. She shook her head angrily, her eyes still bright with tears. Tyler felt sorry for her. Gideon might have saved this young woman's life, but he had also pulled her away from everything she knew and believed. Last night, I had a strong, strong dream, she began. A telling dream, like the kind I used to have back home. A great creature with many fingers, as many fingers as the apple tree outside has branches, held Mr. Gideon. It hurt him and he fought against it, but he was, he was not strong. And then he... And then he... Azinza's face crumpled. He began to melt away. She tried to say more but could not. 
Weeping, she let little Pema help her to a chair. Babel and upset filled the room. Mrs. Needle turned on Ragnar. There! Are you happy to fill these frightened people's heads with such nonsense? Whatever order there had been a moment ago was gone. Everyone in the snake parlor was talking at the same time. Lucinda sidled over to Tyler. I'm scared, she whispered. Where could Gideon have gone? I can think of a few places. He was thinking about the washstand mirror and the shadowy world on the other side of it, but he wasn't going to talk about it, not out loud. Lucinda was the only other person in the house who knew. Still, could Gideon have got into it somehow? Did it have something to do with Mrs. Needle taking the washstand mirror out of the library? What better place to hide someone you don't want found, Tyler thought. Just knock them out and shove them through the mirror. The more he thought about it, the more reasons he came up with that it might be true. But how could he tell the others when he'd been hiding something so important for over a year? His thoughts were interrupted as a sudden quiet fell on the room. Mr. Walkwell stood in the front doorway, his narrow, bearded face gray with dust. I have been down to the fault line, the farm's overseer announced. The bad news is there is no sign of Gideon there. The lock is still on the outside, but I opened it and went down to look and found no recent marks or footprints. I suppose that is also the good news because if he had entered the fault line, there would be nothing we could do to follow him. It has now been locked again. No one else go near. Time to begin the search, then, said Ragnar, before Mrs. Needle could say anything. Hoka, Yeg, the rest of you men, come with me. What if we don't find him? Lucinda asked. The faces of the others showed that they had been wondering about this, too. It was Ragnar who answered. That is too hard a question for today, child. While we search, things will go on as they have. Mr. Walkwell will run the farm. Mrs. Needle will, will see to things in the house. Patience Needle favored him with a poisonous smile. Thank you for giving me permission to do my job, Ragnar Lodbrok. Enough arguing. Mr. Walkwell broke his silence. Back to searching. Search everywhere again. Gideon is old, and he might be hurt. Waste no time. He turned and walked out the door, hooves clicking on the wooden entry hall floor. Most of the men of the farm followed him. But where, Tyler wondered, was Colin Needle? He spotted him a moment later, talking urgently to Lucinda, which bothered Tyler more than it should have. He didn't want the pale young man being friendly to his sister. It was just creepy. Creepy and wrong. Hey, Needle, he called. Needle! The older boy shot him a resentful look. What do you want, Jenkins? I wasn't talking to you. I think your mother knows something about Gideon disappearing. Something she isn't telling us. Tyler! Lucinda said warningly. Don't, he ignored her. Don't lie to us, Needle. You know she had something to do with it, don't you? Tyler took a step nearer. To his satisfaction, Colin took a step back. Just shut up, Jenkins, said the older boy. You don't know anything. You're busy ruining everything while people like me are trying to save this place. Stop it, both of you, Lucinda cried, but Tyler was just getting started. Oh, sure, he said. Save the farm. Like when you tried to sell Meseret's egg to the person Gideon hates most in the world? When you pretty much gave away the secret of this place? Yeah, you really care. Tears actually came into Colin Needle's eyes. He balled his fists, and for a moment Tyler thought the older boy might take a swing at him. But instead, Colin turned and hurried out of the snake parlor toward the front door. Tyler stared after him. What's his problem? You're a creep, Tyler Jenkins, Lucinda said. He came to me for help. He wanted someone to listen to him. And he might have had something important to say about Gideon, but no, you had to be... You had to... 
She turned and stomped out of the room, headed for the kitchen. As the door fell shut behind her, she shouted back, A big creep! Huh? Tyler said it out loud, even though he was now the only person left in the room. I don't get it. What did I do? Chapter 11. Ware Guild. Oh, sweet. Careful now. Lucinda laughed a little nervously as Desta took another carrot from her hand. Lucinda had just discovered, to her astonished delight, that Desta's long tongue was as blue as a summertime sky. Will it stay that color? she asked. Ragnar looked down from the landing above where he was hosing out the cockatrice cages. I do not know. Her mother and father are not that way, but they might have changed. I don't remember what color tongues they had as young worms. He laughed. The sound startled the displaced cockatrices, which hissed at him from their temporary wire cages. Where's Haneb today? Lucinda asked. I thought he was the one who took care of the dragons. Ragnar shrugged as he swept the water toward the drain in the concrete floor. Simos has taken him and your brother and others to walk the hills and canyons. <coughs> there are many trees and deep spots there which could hide someone. A man's body, he had almost said, because now that he was three days missing, Ragnar, Lucinda, and everyone else knew Gideon Goldring might very well be dead. A cloud of fear hung over Ordinary Farm. Lucinda swallowed hard. Ragnar, what if Uncle Gideon doesn't come back? What if we never find him? What happens next? Who will get the farm? That was what she was really asking. Who will take charge of this strangest, most wonderful place on earth? When the Norsemen had all the creatures back in their cage, he latched the door, then pulled off the hood of the hazard suit he wore to protect himself from the creature's poisonous saliva. He clanked down the stairs to join Lucinda as the cockatrices stepped awkwardly around the puddles, hissing at each new outrage to their familiar home. Sawdust and sand now clean and new, their droppings washed from every surface. What happens if he's really gone? she asked again. Here you make a testament, yes? Ragnar asked her. A will? writing down how your treasure will be shared after you are dead. But first someone, one of the city chiefs, what are they called? She thought for a moment. Police? Government? Government, yes. They will send someone, as Gideon always warned us. And how can we let that happen? How can we explain anything about this place? No. Child, Ragnar said seriously, believe me, it will be much better if we find Gideon alive. Much better. Ragnar stood now and watched, shaking his head as Desta wrapped her sky-blue tongue around Lucinda's last carrot and pulled it into her mouth. The dragon crunched contentedly, her long teeth flashing as her jaw opened and closed, then eyed Lucinda to see if there were any more. Haneb had been right. Desta definitely liked carrots. No more today, Lucinda tried to make each thought clear and individual. That's all, but I'll bring you more carrots soon. Would you like that? For a moment, the amber eyes bored into her. Then the dragon, small but still bigger than Lucinda, turned and walked away in awkward dragon fashion, stilting on its back feet and the elbows of its folded wings. But just before Desta pulled herself up onto her nest of straw and old mattresses, Lucinda caught a whisper of happy, greedy thought, faint as a breeze through branches. It was wordless compared to her own, but still had a meaning she could understand. Yes, more, bring more. For a moment, Lucinda thought she'd imagined it, then her heart seemed to spread wings inside her chest. As the cart rolled along, Lucinda watched the hills shimmering in the mid-afternoon heat. 
Do you think that creepy Kingery guy has anything to do with Gideon disappearing? She asked suddenly. Ragnar shook, shook his big shaggy head. I do not believe it, but it could be so. He is a crafty, wicked man. Everyone keeps telling me that. Okay, I believe it. But what did he do? Ragnar stayed silent for a while as the horse slowed to a stop beside Elliot's lagoon, as Gideon sometimes called it. The sea serpent who lived in the small lake didn't need regular feeding. The water just had to be restocked with fish twice a year. But Mr. Walkwell and the Norsemen made a point to check in on Elliot every couple of days. Just now, though, Ragnar wasn't even looking at the water. Things were better before the fire, the big man said suddenly. The fire that burned down Gideon's laboratory? He nodded his head. Grace had been gone for several years. Gideon used his shiny toy almost every day to go into the fault line and search for her, but he would not admit that was what he did. Shiny toy, you mean the continuous scope, the thing Tyler was always going on about. Ragnar nodded again. He called it collecting. He never found grace, but instead he brought back animals and people. I was one of the people he collected. It was a madness, but it was a kind of madness I understand. Ragnar curled the reins into a loop in his massive hand. I, I had a friend once in my old country whose family was killed by raiders from down the coast. From that moment on, my friend was a dead man too, but still walking. He swore he would kill two of the raiders for every one of his that had been taken from him. He put aside the blood gold we call Vergild, so his neighbors and relatives would not have to bear the burden of what he planned to do, then gave away everything else he had, sang his death song, and set out in a small boat. I hear he killed thirteen of the raiders' tribe before they brought him down, one less than the two for each of his, he had promised. Ragnar abruptly laughed. I am sure that his spirit is still angry about that. That's a horrible story. Is it? He seemed surprised. I fear I don't understand this place very well this time. But after Grace was lost, that was how Gideon's spirit was. Like my friend's. Restless and angry. In that first year or two, Gideon brought back many animals and many people. Patience Needle with her son in her belly, Sarah the cook, Kiva and his cousins. Hane came with two small dragons during that time. He was only a child, but already his face was scarred. And Gideon found me too, and of course the other animals. Gideon told me that before she vanished, Grace had begged him to help her use the fault line to save some of the animals that had been lost from the earth. The great worms, the one horns, all of them. And so after he lost her, Gideon did his best to fill the farm with all the animals they had discovered together. Then, one wild night, Gideon came back from the fault line with a ragged, bloody stranger. That was Caesar. We all hurried out to welcome Gideon back, but then we heard a great baying from the fault line cavern. I swear, for a moment I thought Gideon had brought back Fenris, the wolf, instead. I thought the end of days was at hand. For a long moment, the bearded man grew silent as if seeing that night again before his eyes. It was not the great wolf, though, but only a dog, he said at last. But, uh, gods, what a dog! A monster thing that rushed out after Gideon and Caesar and would have pulled them both down and killed them. 
but Simos was faster. You, you should have seen him, child. Do you think I am strong? Walkwell seized that dog with one hand around its neck and threw it so far away that it did not rise after it had fallen. And then Kingari appeared, tall and dark of face as Loki, the mischief-maker himself. He scarcely looked down at the dog's body as he passed, but stared only at Gideon and Caesar. I did not speak English well then. I had only been speaking your tongue for a year, but I understood what he said next. You have something of mine. What was he talking about? Lucinda asked. Ragnar was squinting against the sun. A rolling silvery something appeared for a moment at the center of Elliot's lagoon. He shook his head. He meant Caesar. What? The big man shrugged. I do not know the history of this land well, but I know there was a time not long ago here in America when they still had thralls, what you call slaves. Caesar was a slave who had escaped. Kingery was the man who was trying to bring him back. Oh, no. What happened? Why did Gideon bring someone so terrible back to the farm? He didn't. Not by choice, anyway. Gideon had made one of his devil's bargains to help Caesar escape his pursuers. But somehow the fault line stayed open longer than usual, and King Ari followed them back. At first, King Ari would not believe what had happened, but at last he came to see the truth. Then what? Gideon promised Kingery that if he behaved himself, he could live on the farm too and be safe. But that was bargaining with the devil. Jackson Kingery stayed only until he had learned what he could. Then, on the night of the laboratory fire, he slipped away. We have not seen him since, at least not until you met him in the street. Me, I hoped we would never see him again. Thinking how close she had been to this kingery made Lucinda feel queasy. Why is everyone scared of him? Ragnar shook his head, firmly this time. You do not need to hear any more stories. All you need to know is to keep away from this man. If you ever see him again, tell Simos or me as fast as you can. Or Gideon. Lucinda's heart fell further. Tell Gideon. Sure, if we ever find him. If this kingery guy hasn't killed him or something. Ragnar clicked his tongue and flapped the reins. Culpepper began to pull the wagon back onto the road, leaving Elliot and his broad silver pawn behind. Do not as underestimate Gideon Goldring, child, the bearded man said. You already know how stubborn he is. Well, Gideon is also stronger and more determined than you can guess. And that's the end of the chapter. So before we start chapter 12, which is called Ergodicity and other big words, uh, that will have to wait until next week. And meanwhile, I am going to be wrapping it up here. So, <clears throat> meanwhile, was there anybody that I wanted to check in with that I didn't get a chance to check in with. No, look. Oh, Tash is here and Felina and Angie. I think I already said hello to Angie. So I think Tash, Tash and Claudia were the most recent ones and Felina. Anyway, um, so there we are. And it has been uh, a huge pleasure as always to share time with you even though I've gone out of focus again. But uh, that probably made it more of a pleasure for all of you out there, not having to see my battered countenance quite so clearly. Um, and with that, I say farewell, and thank you again for joining me. Take good care of yourselves. Take good care of the folks around you. Um, we move slowly forward, two steps forward, step and a half back, but that still means forward progress. And that's what we're all doing our best to do. 
And so please take good care of yourselves. You're all important. And I will see you very soon, next weekend, in fact. As far as I know, I will be reading at the regular times, but it never hurts to check um, just in case uh, I have to cancel or I have to change times or I have to change the arrangements somehow. So please do check in with me at least occasionally um, uh, in the week leading up. Um, and until that moment, I say good night, peace, and ciao, ragazzi. <laughs>